Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Can you believe it's been half a year since we spoke to the holder of the Rune Soup Astrology Chair, which is an unpaid position, Austin Kopic? I do so look forward to these catch-ups. Uh, they're an opportunity to reflect and take stock and reposition for the next six months. I always learn a lot. And I always have a good time, so enjoy. Well, well, well. Look who's back. Mr. Kopic, how are things? They are good. Can you believe it's been six months? <sighs> yes and no, right? Um, it's one of those uh, cases where there's been so much that's happened, Um that it's kept things moving really quickly. It's always the next thing. And when, I don't know, our experience of time is going like that, it seems like it takes no time at all. But, you know, in looking back, and as I did before this podcast, and thinking about what's happened and how to categorize that and list that, it seems like there's a... Uh, an astonishing plethora <laughs> of events, large and small, um, some more easily sorted than others. Yes, uh, I believe I mentioned on uh, Higher Side Chat that there's been some sort of accidental uh, rigor or a change in perspective in kind of concentrating uh, parapolitical and geopolitical conversation that I publish weekly as a newsletter in newsletter format rather than on the blog, because I, I will get to Friday morning when I sit down to write it and look back over the week and go, seriously, it's been seven days. <laughs> and uh, which thing do I pick? Yeah, well, and there's also, um, there, you know, there's, it's almost like a shell game with what's the real story. Absolutely. Um, like, there are very important real stories in progress right now. But then there are, there are all of these other half real, quarter real, 10% real, or almost wholly false stories at the same time. And it makes it, I don't know, I think it's been making it exhausting to follow because not only is it can it be exhausting to follow a story, but there's all the, there's this meta layer of work of sorting out what are the real stories and what is, you know, what is either intentionally or accidentally um, kind of being uh, serving to throw us off. Yeah. And I think you need to uh, graciously accept the scout badge for most appropriate 2017 motif to do with fire and smoke in that sense, because when you look at more commonly used metaphors for the fact that there's a lot of garbage out there, um, the, the fire and smoke one is a good match because where there's smoke, there's fire, uh, but it's very difficult to see things, and and that kind of fire, smoke, and shadow component is uh, is a very good description. That is, you know, is a nice kind of folding in of of the space weather into, I would say, best practice <laughs> for navigating uh, 2017. If you still think there is, uh, if your life is still personally enriched by uh, by chasing every one of these little, you know, dust devils as they uh, as they roll past. And, and that's an open question as to whether that is the case. But hats off to you, sir. Oh, thanks. I'm glad it was useful. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with the uh, uh, with what I wrote down in December about this year. Um, I, I feel like um, the pieces of advice that I wrote that I followed uh, have been very useful. And uh, it's left me wishing I was a better student of my own work <laughs> <laughs> yeah well let's talk about some of that then i mean let's talk uh given that it has been another six months about uh what happened in the skies and what happened in the land uh, over the last six months and, and try and pick that thread back up okay well i i think there are the probably the two biggest things that happen in the skies um, were one, the big solar eclipse uh, at the very end of February, and its um, overlap bleed into 
uh, Venus's retrograde, which lasted from early March until mid-April, with sort of uh, some wings extending a few direct a few weeks in either direction, or a blast zone extending temporally, <laughs> maybe on that. Um, there are a couple other things, but I, I'd say those were the two big ones. Um, we had and- a lot of planets uh, rowing ba- rowing the boat backwards at at one time there, which uh, I think a lot of people struggled with. And uh, and whilst it was a kind of shitty Mercury retrograde, at least in discussing the people, well, in discussion with the people uh, who follow such things, um, uh, quite a few of them were unaware of uh, yeah, just how many <laughs> how many uh, of the planets were rowing backwards. Well, actually, so that's interesting that you bring that up. I'm going to take advantage of that in order to do a PSA. Go for it. Um, (laughs) So um, Mercury and Venus were both retrograde for a little bit less than a week. Um, And Jupiter is retrograde and Saturn is retrograde. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Um, You absolutely have to differentiate between... Uh, between outer planets, those which are beyond the asteroid belt, um, and which are also just much larger, all the gas and ice giants, their retrograde for a third, a third plus of every year, and they do so on an extremely regular basis. And so they don't really have the quality of sudden and acute disruption which the planets, which are part of the inner solar system, have when they are retrograde in relationship to us. Mercury and Venus, um, because they're much closer and they're much faster and their retrogrades are um, less seemingly regular um, than uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, um, have a capacity to disrupt things in a way that the outer planet retrogrades don't. Um, It would be... It would be useful, I think, for a lot of people to think of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto being retrograde as simply being tidal motion, like there's an in and out, um, and that it's not. It, it, there's no reason to freak out when the tide starts going out, right? Whereas Mercury, Venus, Mars, um, you have much more disruptive activity. Um, it's much more contrary to the normal rhythm of life. Um, and therefore cause for problem solving when they're retrograde relative to us. And so I see a lot of um, mm, not entirely uh, informed uh, uh, chicken littling about, oh my God, Jupiter's retrograde and paralleling it to, let's say, a Venus, to, let's say, Venus's retrograde. Venus's retrogrades are very disrupt or can be very disruptive. Um, in particular for relationships for people. A lot of times people go through um, an important ordeal during those Venus retrogrades and changes, good, bad, and other, come out of those. Um, and they, the, like, the Mercury retrograde should not be paralleled with the Saturn retrograde. Those planets occupy a totally different layer of our solar system. And yes, their meaning is different. Um, when they are retrograde, or you get a different facet of the total meaning cycle. Um, but it, it, it's just not like, oh my God, you guys, Saturn's retrograde. That is true for over four months every year. So how often do we get four plus retrograde at once? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not too uh, not too often, but um, if we're counting Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, um relatively often you just add a mercury on top of that it's um that i i do think that so just mercury and venus at the same time any two of the inner planets retrograde at the same time oh yeah um but a lot of um a lot of the difficulties i saw during that period were primarily related to the venus retrograde because venus goes deep venus is uh you know the Venus speaks to a person's passions and what they really want and what they thought they wanted and whether they're happy with what they've chosen. And so when you get retrogradation, when you go into a sort of an underworld phase with that and, you know, you sort of melt down your jewelry, um, 
there's uh, it, it, it's a it's the underworld of the heart um and it's um it, it is core of those those journeys like uh nana's journey down to uh reunite with her dark sister Haresh kagal are necessarily kind of Mm, emotionally bloody and intense mercury's retrograde which happens five or six times as often as venus's retrograde you know it's it's an underworld of the mind which you know is a real place and matters and can be disturbing or confusing or irritating or inconvenient um but it doesn't have the same depth um and so yeah. Anyway, um, when you have two of those at once, sure. But I, a lot of the the Ermagerds that I heard were really were clearly traceable to the Venus retrograde. Fair enough. Is there you use the Inanna motif there? Uh, with Venus being the morning star, is there a kind of um, Lucifer in hell component to that, or are we looking at a better uh, is is Inanna because it's an underworld of the heart, like a a better sort of myth cycle to ride these things along? Well, um, there's a strong argument to be made that the um, the Anana going to reunite where or going to meet her dark sister Resh Kigel and then emerge uh, back into the overworld and all that um, that that was actually a myth cycle that was built to describe Venus's retrograde. Yeah. Um, whether it was or was not, I tend to think it was. Um, uh, it's very useful. So one of the things uh, to remember about Venus's uh, retrograde is that uh, in the lead up, um, you see Venus as the evening star. And she's been dropping slowly, slowly, slowly towards the western horizon for months uh, in that appearance after, you know, at dusk. Right. And then the retrograde cycle sees Venus disappear in the west for several weeks and then reappear in the east right so we're going through the gate of death in the west and then we're coming up through the gate of rebirth in the east um and so the superimposition of uh of of a and the same thing happens with mercury by the way during mercury's retrograde cycle and so the superimposition of a an underworld journey onto that makes a lot of sense um also if you look at Anana's myth, there are a lot of um, husbands alive and dead whose status is being uh, wrangled with. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, um, you know, it's literally, uh, it's an underworld story um, that is undertaken for the sake of relationships, right? And relationships are very much um, Venus's terrain. Venus has some other terrain, but that's, um, that's the piece that uh, people tend to <laughs> care the most about. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? It's good. And presumably that's where, we, you know, if uh, Mercury pops up on the other side as well, it's, that's presumably tied to the sort of uh, Hermes Chthonios psychopomp role. Of. It literally, it's going down in the west to arise, at, and then being invisible only to arise in the east. Like that's a classic. Like that's the direction you enter the underworld from, and that's the direction you leave the underworld from. Um, yeah, it's good. These are uh, good ways for people to think about it when uh, you know when these things happen. Uh, you know, moving through time when you end up with retrogrades and you, you want to work out how to think about them and, and, and how to participate in them because, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean good and bad. You're kind of just rolling with ways of exploring, you know, human psychology and being in the world and how that matches to where we are um, in, in a kind of localization sense. I don't know if I'm describing that correctly, but there are ways of moving through the space where that, that doesn't um, have to be exclusively disruptive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's... Um, so, you know, the interesting thing is that the cycles which we experience as deviations from or disruptions of the norm are regularly scheduled parts of the, you know, uh, <laughs> of, uh, like, those are parts of the cycles. But we often experience them as moments outside of our normal cycles or the end of one of our cycles or in, slash the beginning of another, 
right? You know, I, I, I like to use the um, some of the Tibetan concepts of the bardo in addressing certain phases of time and experience for people. And even though the bardo is this, you know, this, this, this void, this rift between stable lives or incarnations, it's still part of the wheel. Right. But you don't see that on the wheel. When you look at the big Yama wheel, right, you see the six realms, but you don't see the uh, you don't see the Bardos um, as clearly. Right. So let's come back to the eclipse, because uh, 20, yeah, yeah. 2017 has uh, two of them that are worth. Well, two that are worth talking about. Uh, so let's talk about the February one and uh, and, and what that what the match to uh, what happened looks like there. Well, um, I'm going to have to confess some ignorance as to what it looked like in the macro world, because uh, that one hit my wife and I's charts squarely, and we moved and had a death in the family in the same week. Um, and so um, uh, <laughs> it was it was a profound transition. And so I, I, I admit I was not... Um, following what was happening in the weeks surrounding that you were austin retrograde at the time yeah i was uh yeah is that uh is that typical for an eclipse like of uh, is that typical for an eclipse that has configurations such as we saw in february um okay so big disruption uh, that kind of thing Yes. Um, What's interesting, what's really interesting about eclipses is that they appear as a disruption of the normal sun-moon cycle, right? And so for those of your your, uh, listeners, I was going to say viewers, I guess they look at the YouTube page, (laughs) or they look at their computer (laughs) while the player plays it, right? Uh, Or if you're listening in a car, please do watch the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, as your listeners may or may not know, um, in a, a solar eclipse is just a really special new moon. It's when the, the sun and the moon occupy the same slice of sky. And usually the moon is a little bit above or below the sun, and so you can't see it, right? And then, and whereas a solar eclipse is when they're aligned, their declination is aligned perfectly so that the, when, they, when they do that overlap, which they do every 29.5 days, um, the moon gets in the way of the sun, right? And so a new moon is just, or excuse me, a solar eclipse is just a special new moon. And then a lunar eclipse is just a special full moon. And so what's interesting about these um, is that they, the eclipses are, uh, you know, should we say they're, they're, they're a seeming disruption of the lunar cycle, right? But what's interesting is that they're actually a more perfect, precise alignment of both of those two points in the lunar cycle. Right. Um, you know, the new moon is when the sun and the earth line up. And if you looked at it from, a, you know, 10 million miles away in space, or you might need more than that, let's say 100 million miles away, they would just, you're not going to see much difference between a new moon and a solar eclipse. But it's just that like one or two degrees of being more in alignment that makes it for the moon to actually block the sun from our point of view that makes it a perfect you know that makes it a solar eclipse and so what's interesting is that again while they appear disruptive it's actually more normal in a sense like if the if the universe was perfectly mathematical and everything all of the circles were exactly 360 degrees rather than being slightly ovoid every new moon would be an eclipse and so you actually have this more perfect alignment um which in my experience on a visionary level it felt it the solar eclipses feel like it's sort of like the uh the magical and the physical or whatever you want to call it the spirit world and the material world actually click into place where there's a a a gateway or a tunnel that opens and more can slosh from the invisible into the visible and more can go from the visible back into the invisible and so when eclipses 
when eclipses trigger events, which they certainly can, especially if they're right on top of a, <clears throat> an important planet in your chart, let's say that that planet is the uh, the lord of the year according to perfection cycle, or et cetera, et cetera, right? You bring the astrological filters to bear. Um, you get really powerful events um, that often have, uh, or almost always have, uh, a very strangely faded quality, like it was just waiting to happen. Um, and that's not true with everything that astrology indicates. Astrology also indicates just like, you know, uh, 70, you know, uh, partially cloudy with a 20% chance of stubbing your toe, which doesn't seem to have any connection with what we might meaningfully experience or call fate, right? But eclipses bring these big, again, seemingly um, experientially faded shifts, which may be good, bad, or usually a very convoluted combination of the two. Gotcha. So we do have another one uh, that's worth talking about coming up in H2 of this year. But before we... Uh, what I want to do when we talk about H2 is kind of move down from the longer wave cycles to the shorter wave to discussing you know, how people should think about H2. But before we leave okay. H1... Uh, are there any other kind of parts that we want to talk about? Are there continuations of, well, usually with a long wave cycle, that is the case, but are there continuations of parts of H1 that we want to begin that discussion of H2 with? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the configurations that uh, has a couple or that runs throughout this year and has a couple like precise um, moments is the uh, the on and off opposition between Jupiter, which is in tropical Libra, and Uranus, which is in tropical Aries. So, um, what's what's interesting about Jupiter in Libra by itself um, is that it's historically a very peacemaking, moderate um, position, but and when, when we look at Uranus, and particularly Uranus in Aries, which is a Mars-ruled sign, um, Uranus is um, uh, Uranus's character is uncompromising, idealistic, um, uh, extremely disruptive. Sometimes very empowering, sometimes shatteringly disempowering. And so when you have those two planets on opposite sides, right, which means that, you know, what's interesting about when planets are in opposition in a chart, what that means is that when one rises in the east, the other sets in the west, it means that they refuse to share the same part of the sky together, right? And that's, it's a literal truth, but it's also, it has... I don't know, I think it has some nice poetic implications. And so what happens when planets are opposed <clears throat> is they, uh, they, end up, um, they end up fighting about things. And so and they end up, if they have contrary qualities, as Uranus and, and, <clears throat> and, uh, and Jupiter do, you get, you know, Jupiter's all about moderate reconciliation, even when it's not in Libra. You know, if you look at classical texts, Jupiter's always about moving back to center, like finding something that everyone can live with. Um, whereas Uranus has no truck with that. And so um, our, the first exact opposition was actually in December of last year. Um, and then we got another exact opposition uh, in the first quarter. Um, and that was when we uh, that was uh, that was when we had the um, <clears throat> the women's march in DC, which was just a massive protest. Um, and Uranus in general is it's a protest planet and Jupiter. I think most astrologers expected massive protests out of Jupiter and Uranus. Um, and then we've sort of, and there, you know, and that sort of set the ball rolling in a lot of ways. Um, and we have another Jupiter Uranus opposition in September, and that's actually the third and final of that. And so there, there are the, there are the things you can say about like the moment when some you know when a configuration is at its height like the week around that with a slow moving configuration like that you know yeah there'll be lots of protest right um but there's also what happens in between like what's going on with that current in between the the really obvious loud portions right and it 
um, on a very simple level that Jupiter opposition Uranus is the moderate and the extreme um, being um, at war with one another or being in constant contention um, and going back and forth and back and forth. And w what's interesting is it seems like, I don't know how to put this. It's like, um, like there's the, there's, there's been this ongoing sorting into categories where people are either getting, people are either going in for um, one extreme or they're, they're running back to the middle. It seems the like kind of left or kind of right is getting sorted um, back toward the middle or toward, or being pushed very far in either of those directions. And that's a uh, that that's an observation of a trend. I don't know if that makes sense or if you see something similar or contrary. I think that uh, a way of describing that would be uh, moving from a spectrum to a binary on both left and right. So you, you sort of yeah. have a, a previous blend is now either um, you know you're out in the street burning effigies or uh, or you you're sitting in this kind of new labor middle, and uh, and and that does seem to be um, a, a motif. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, and on a personal level, that Jupiter opposite Uranus, which is basically in late degrees of Libra, tropical Libra and Aries, is, um, uh, is, is more about figuring out um, the, the difference between trying to do a gradual improvement in some area of your life or big leap, right? Because that uh, Uranus has that surprise component, doesn't it? Yeah, when Uranus is about making um, positive change or change favorable change, let's say uh, favorable to you at least, um, it's uh, it's always a it's always a jump. It's the quantum leap. It's the picking up everything and getting in the wagon and going west. Um, it's not um, it's not a gradual. <clears throat> let's work on this. Let's save a penny a day. And in 10 years, we'll have this with compound interest. Um, you know, you, you have, gra in a sense, it's, um, it's reform versus revolution if we're using political terms for it. Um, is it reflected militarily as well? So that uh, Uranus in Aries is sort of surprise breakouts of conflict, like dropping Moabs? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's um yeah, it's it, it it's burst. Uranus is very bursty, right? Um it's bursty, it's irregular, um it's not it's not steady. Um and yeah, it's uh you know, one naturalistic metaphor that's useful for understanding Uranus is uh, a lightning strike. Like if something gets struck by lightning, there's a tremendous amount of power there. Um but because it's difficult to predict, you can't necessarily capture that and then run your machinery on it. Gotcha. That's good. I like that. Um, so who wins on a manstrological basis? Mm, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would see one as necessarily winning. I think the, you know, I think the result will be um what we can see into this sorting process um i think we're gonna mm -hmm. i think there's gonna be i think the dynamic is gonna shift it i think i think this will shift things towards a um sort of extreme versus not extreme or you know anti you know to a certain degree i i, th I you, you look at the the internets um and you see some people um going towards the middle out uh, or what they see as the middle um out of a need to or excuse me out of a rejection of what they're seeing of the extremes of whatever side they see themselves on and that's not necessarily a very that's not necessarily a very permanent shift but I, I do think that that sorting into a binary on each side will be the result you know because it's already ongoing but on a, in a larger historical sense right like isn't part of our problem right now that neither side that's sort of a uh, a false choice or that they're like the they're you know the how should we put this um talking politics publicly is so stressful um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um 
it isn't the isn't the issue that we don't have like a good answer for the present like there are a lot of things in you know the american binary um you know there are a lot of things i like about the democratic platform but there are also a lot of things which if that was implemented are going to go wholly unaddressed right like nobody's talking about um you know the inevitable increase of unemployment due to um digital you know uh, digital <laughs> digital and robotic servants or and that's really just like one of an entire basket of issues that are already here that are going to become really obvious in four or five years or maybe less um like we we need some new thinking right um we need new alternatives and so you know, as much as, in, to a certain degree, I don't know, I think the, the Jupiter-Uranus thing, although it can time certain events uh, in, in our politics, is not necessarily, it's not a, a, it's a, it's a little bit of sh- uh, rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I think we're all doomed, but I, I do think that there are certain ways of looking at things and framing things that are long past their expiration date. I think that's where I was going to say, because I, I know what you mean about talking around rather than at politics. I was going to say, I think uh, looking at this and, and using that um, sorting description, I think this is a this is a phase we go through on the way. And the choice is either to do like a, a really bad, uh, you know, terrifying totalitarian thing that comes after this or working out a new way of uh, of thinking about how we are aligned politically or spread across the spectrum politically so as to match the uh the changes that are coming in the medium term and and that is generally if you even just on a psychological basis if you look at the fact that uh both sides at their edges which are growing are not satisfying places to be which is very different to saying they're the same thing uh where this is people struggling for finding new words and and new ideas for matching politics to the changing world and i'm just wondering if if this process of kind of like uh surprise motherfucker uranus aries and 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 jupiter libra is uh what that looks like as we shift and adjust Mm, I think it's uh, so Jupiter, Jupiter's time in Libra and oppositions with Uranus are only, you know, a year long. Mm -hmm. And so it can only speak to shifts that can happen during a year. Right. So it it plays a role this year. I I mean, on on a very simple level, um, I think that it's going to help. I think it's going to make clear what's not helpful. Oh, good. Right. I think more people, I think more, I think, um, I think more people will be very unclear, will be very, will be increasingly clear on what's not working, you know, by the end of this cycle. But that's, um, that's, that's a far cry away from having figured it out. Sure, sure. But that, I, I'll take that win. Like, so this is what you were talking about before, where, uh, it's not one of these things wins, but the outcome is, uh, that. So there's not a winner, but there is an outcome. And uh, and honestly, right. if we get to the end of 2017, and and that realization is more widespread, we should uh, take that win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I don't know. I I think it's part of a larger pattern that's you know kind of running through. Well, the last last year, this year, and next couple years is. Going through, um, going through, and giving all of these not answers um, a chance to shine, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> and then being like, "Oh yeah, well that's 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 not going to do it," um, and uh, you know, kind of having to come face facts because I feel like collectively um, there are just certain facts that um you know and you can you can like uh like you often uh, point out data and interpretation are different just like um just like problem and solution are different but you can identify problems you know uh, you can identify um short-term trends right 
you know, you can identify things that are definitely happening. Um, and then you can start experimenting with answers. Um, you know, I think that um, people, it was one of the things I see a lot in my consulting work and just being a person is that people are pretty good at identifying problems, but they're pretty bad about wanting to wait until they have the perfect, flawless, can't possibly fail answer to try to answer that question. Whereas um, actually answering questions, unlike in high school, is not pass fail. It's usually the beginning of an experimental period, right? Where you figure out what works and how it works and, you know, you mess with it and refine it, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're saying, because I would nail you to this, because uh, I, I hope it's hopeful, is what you're saying is maybe uh, when this cycle winds up, one of the outcomes could be people sit down and go, so it turns out Nazism isn't the correct response to structural industrial unemployment. Uh, yes, like, so I, think, we, like, I think we, go, I, we I, tried I think, Nazism, I, that didn't work. <laughs> like, well, is that the thing going is, to we be... tried. Yeah, uh, so, and the thing is, I. I don't know. This is part of this, this is leading into next year, which I can't talk about the rest of this year without leading into next sure. year because it's so contextual. Um, you know, we've so. It, oh God. Okay. There are various components of this discussion which need to be laid down before I can do this. Uh, all right. Well, so let me just say that I think, as we've discussed before. Um, there's a lot of trying to reenact um, 19th or early 20th century solutions, um, which is going poorly. And there's a lot of being terrified of those solutions or those non solutions, what, those, those fixes that were attempted for, you know, 1857 era capitalism, <laughs> right? Like, cause I, you know, what I, what, one of the things I see is, um, you know, people are seeing Nazis everywhere. People are also seeing hardline communists everywhere. And everybody's like, everybody's mind goes instantly to the horrors, um, that the full implementation of those ideas, um, you know, brought in the 20th century. Right. And that there's this sort of like both enacting those as well as being terrified of the other side's version. It's very like, you know, it's very time travel y. Right. It's like everybody's stuck in, oh, I don't know, like 1935 or something. Um, and so, and that going back into the past, I, I, I feel like, okay, so there is this current taking us back into the past. And I think that will intensify and become more clear when Saturn moves into Capricorn at the very end of this year. And then we get two, two and a half years of Saturn and Pluto together in Capricorn. And that's historically, um, that's very backward looking. It's very much, you know, the, the, you know, it's very much a matter of to tombs and tomes, libraries and graveyards, um, and a, a sort of, uh, a journey to the deep past. Um, and there are a lot of things that we're going to find there. Um, as you and I have found things that modernity left behind the various babies ejected from the bathwater somehow still, still breathing. Um, and that there is a lot from the past that we need before we can move forward. But there are also a lot of horrible things in the past. There are a lot of, um, it's like, like there are a lot of diseases um, which, have, uh, which we thought were extinguished. But like people are catching ideological viruses from, you know, from the 1870s. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like I thought we were done with that. Is right? this, and that's yeah, part is, of the danger of time traveling, right? It's like we've lost our immunity to some of these things because we thought they were gone. Is this, uh, it's a sort of twofold question, but I, I know exactly what you mean. And it funnily enough reminds me of some of the more uh, materialist interpretations of uh, what happens if you're drowning and, and you have um, your life flash before your eyes. One of the interpretations is it's the mind flipping back through its experiences going, hmm, I don't know what to do here. What have I, you know, what have I got in the uh, library to, to match this? And there's a sort of weird sense of, um, falling back on on uh, in a panicked way on ideas that aren't a good match because 
of of the sort of macro changes that are going on and that seems interesting to me that yes we 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 um we've panicked and landed on the both the, the the two worst extremes of the left and right simultaneously uh, uh but as you say i also think that this comes back to that kind of smoke shadow fire thing uh i think some of that fear is overblown because we're in this sort of panic state uh absolutely and, uh, absolutely and that's what i yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. There you go. Oh, I was just going to say that's part of what I meant about projecting, like seeing Nazis, seeing like hardline uh, totalitarian communism everywhere. It's like it's a uh, you know it's it's like um, it, there are these historical traumas that are being reinvigorated on a personal level, right? It's like you see you know you see one thing which you know seems like a little bit too far in one direction, and suddenly like that's you know, suddenly that person is a, you know, is a Stalinist, right? Um, <laughs> and sure, there are some people who are um, moving further into, you know, the left and right extremes and during the present, but there's also, I would say there's a lot more fear of that. And to a certain degree, a lot of people are, you know, like, just like I said, some, a lot of people who are, who are moving towards the perceived middle are just backing away from ideas or behaviors that they don't want to be associated with. At the same time, I think that's also happening with the extremes is looking at the other extreme, be like, Oh God, how can I get farther away from that? That's a nightmare. Um, and, but again, it's, there's a lot of, oh, it's, it's just a lot of backing away. It's sort of, you know, we talked last time a little bit, and we've talked privately about uh, dystopias, and this is the, the golden age of dystopia. It's sort of like, you know, um, everybody's backing away from everybody else's dystopia, but sort of accidentally, it's very easy when you're in that condition of not moving towards something to accidentally trip and fall and become, you know, and land in your own dystopia. It's like, well, I'm not going to do that Nazi thing. And then suddenly, you know, and then suddenly there, there are shadows of the early 20th century and all of that. And, you know, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And the, the utopia dystopia thing's quite good. It was interesting. I shared, for people listening, uh, a New Yorker article with Austin the other day, which we could have written, probably not as well, uh, describing uh, the upcoming novels that are uh, some really um, disappointing from an ambition perspective uh, dystopias, predictable ones. So there's a reality TV star who's like king of the world and, and all this. And you go, really? Is This is like... Uh, Having been to film school, this is sort of first year film school narratives, and uh, and there's nothing. Um, yeah, as we move into that kind of um, goat king of death phase that you're, you're mentioning, there is an opportunity potentially. <laughs> uh, I don't believe I called it that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that's we'll what see. the episode's going to be called now: <laughs> Austin and the Goat King of Death. That's my new dystopia. Uh, Excellent. It. There is an opportunity to, and we were talking about it before. the The radical thing is to um, provide, or more like embody, uh, another and even more optimistic way of of uh, of being. Rather than like everyone, like stuff is bad at the moment. <laughs> do Do we need to raise awareness about that? Is that is that is that a not that I'm saying art needs to kind of fall into a um, positivist, improve the world kind of sense, but it just seems like uh, I'm frustrated by the the failure of ambition and and um, and I guess maybe understanding of longer waves here, and and that's weirdly in that sort of utopia dystopia world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, there's um, I don't know if art, I don't know if art needs to improve the world. I, I my experience of the art that I like gives me a perspective that I didn't have, or helps me imagine things in a way I hadn't before. Um, and so you know, we can say that a lot of uh, a lot of the dystopian literature is at this point preaching to the choir. Yeah, right. It's sort of like. You know, it, it it's more of uh, it, it. I guess it takes on more the pleasures of genre fiction. Like, oh God, I can't wait until the the part where hope is extinguished, right? And we find out that they're really, you know, we really have no power. Because I sure feel that way, and that's uh, that's affirming, right? And I'm waiting for that beat, 
Um, and I don't know, I, I think as a person whose job role um, is uh, at many times to speak to the present, um, I, I find, I, I feel like the present, I feel like uh, there, when you engage with people's idea of the present, um, it's usually a reaction to the present rather than a clear-eyed assessment of it. And that one of the things that astrology can do is it can help you look, it gives you an external referent for looking at a particular moment, which um, uh, is extremely useful if you're in a position where you're reacting rather than seeing the present. And it's not that astrology just gives you this crystal thing and that you don't look upon those configurations with your own hopes, fears, and ideas, but it, it helps. It's a filter, right? Um, and I think that, um, you know, simply, simply doubling down on the, you know, common nonsense uh, of a particular time is not helping at all. You're not like you might as well have not spoken. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, that kind of let's return to uh, H2. And yeah, next yeah year. sorry. This has gotten very wide ranging. No, well, don't apologize. It's good stuff because, in, in a way, um, I have a question about um, Saturn, Pluto, Capricorn, but I'll wait until we talk about. And as you say, um, we want to talk about H2 2017, but some of the uh, longer waves need to encompass a wider time than that and and we've got that one but uh let's let's see what else uh what else is going on for h2 well so there's the big solar eclipse right um the, it's been dubbed the great american eclipse which i think is big fun um and it's a total solar eclipse uh very late in the sign of tropical leo it's actually in leo in both uh sidereal and tropical zodiacs actually now that i think about it um and um, it's a big one, um, and it's being called the Great American Eclipse um, because it'll be visible from sea to shining sea. Um, the totality starts, oh, I don't know, 200 miles north of where I am in uh, central Oregon. And then I believe the exit wound is somewhere around Cal uh, so South Carolina. Maybe it's North Carolina, the Carolinas. Um, and it's uh, so in... The traditional lore of eclipses, um, they matter no matter where they happen, but they especially matter in the area where they are visible, right? And this is the first uh, total solar eclipse in 100 years to be this visible in this much of the United States, right? And it, it does seem that the United States is very much at a crisis point. Right. I'd say we've been the United States has been working its way into a crisis for <laughs> for several years, um, but you know, in many ways, Trump is is the is um, a, a symptom which is impossible to ignore of a system in crisis. Right? It's one thing to like not be feeling so good, but then you get like a big, you know, you get a big tumor with a wig on right and say, it's, he's he's the cancer he's not the emphysema he's the cancer he's not the smoking so yeah it's yeah. awful it's awful but it's um it's not a standalone awful it, it's awfulness is is frankly highly predictable yeah yeah i mean that's the course of the disease right um and so you know it seems um seems pretty appropriate that we would have not an unprecedented eclipse um, but a rare, uh, a, um, a rare eclipse um, in you know coming to shine its uh, <laughs> uh, well shine you know, cast its anti shine on that particular tumor, and you know as I as I mentioned before, this one's really interesting because it is right on top of um, Trump's ascendant and Mars position based on the data we have, which looks pretty good. Um, and I mean, we know that it's in, in many ways, it's about him anyway. Right. But you do have that. Uh, you do have that sort of writ plainly in the way that it overlaps with his chart. And 
So, so it's you know, not Great American Eclipse. It's Make Solar Eclipse is Great Again. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and so also what's interesting is that this is um, – so there are a couple different ways of categorizing eclipses. Um, one relatively simple one from an astrological point of view is uh, looking at which signs they occur in. Because they occur in the same signs, the same pair of opposed signs for about a year and a half at a time. And so it just so happens that the United States was born, Declaration of Independence, um, under this eclipse cycle. Um, and so it's a return. And that's not a... Uh, that that's a like that's a once every nineteen year thing or eighteen point six year thing. That's not like once every four hundred years, right? But it's you know there there's an overlap there, and that you know whenever we're dealing with Leo, which is the sign of the sun, if you looked at any traditional astrological textbook, they would say, oh, well, if you're interpreting what this means for the for the kingdom, um, it speaks to the status of the king. And that um, solar eclipses, especially total, total ones, are pretty much universally negative omens for the king of a land, if that solar eclipse is seen overhead in that land. Um, and I would have to double check this, but I bet that goes back to the earliest um, Babylonian divinations that we have. Uh, recording the, uh, the 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 possible probable meaning of an eclipse, um, and so it certainly it certainly speaks to a crisis point in leadership, um, and it's you know there's sure you know there's Donald Trump himself, but it's also though how did we get here, and then what do we do next, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I mean like. Uh, there's, you know, so assume, let's say that Donald Trump um, leaves the national stage and the presidency. Great. We have all of the problems that were unsolved before the election. We have all of the, uh, you know, the long, medium and short term changes, which are coming at us full speed. Um, and we have a, a poverty of answers. Um, well, that's really because uh, I want to talk about, uh, and well, it, obviously it's speculation, but I want to talk about how we can interpret it. And it's interesting that now that in, in the 21st century, we have kingship as an abstracted idea. So a job change in the role of the king uh, does appear to involve him because of, as you say, it, it, it sits atop his Cheeto chart. Um, but it is about like kingship. It is about actually the role, because if he like at the beginning of the year, uh, it seemed just looking at how the house was stacked, very unlikely he would be impeached. But who even fucking knows now that we're in June 2017? If he is, you end up with Mike Pence, who is in many ways worse when it comes to his religiosity and his opinion about um, abortion and gays and, and, and so on. And you look at the Democrats who, who still are blaming everyone but themselves for the fact that we're in this mess. And so if he does leave, it's just... Oh, oh it, I don't know. Democrats are pretty good at blaming each other. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the main one. Anything. I'm talking about the main one who seems to think it's, you know, everyone's fault but her own. And you look at it and go, you're a mess. So... We, get, we have this disaster collapsing before our very eyes and no viable alternative. Australia went through a mild version of this with uh, John Howard a, a while ago, where the Labour Party was in just absolute disarray, stabbing itself in the back, putting up leaders who couldn't beat him in the first place. And, and you have to turn around and ask yourself, well, you have to look at yourself and go, look. It is in some sense your fault <laughs> that you couldn't organize a credible opposition that we're here. And I, and I like to think about it in the sense of you, you're having an eclipse in that kind of kingship, a, a, an eclipse of kingship or, or of governance. As or, well yeah, or as, just, let, we yeah. can call it, I, let's call it leadership, sure. right? It's a crisis of leadership. And that's, you know, the eclipse is mm, sort of an acute moment in that. Um, because people need to, we need to figure out what leadership looks like and we need better political leadership. Like obviously the alternative, you know, I, I mean, if in many ways, the last American election, as well as a lot of other countries elections have been like, really, oh, this, is, yeah. this is how we're going to do leadership. This is, um, this is a, this is a Western crisis. It's just that it's a, um, Make eclipse is great again. Eclipse this year, so it's gonna it's gonna land where you guys are. But this is a Western crisis where you look across the world and go, hmm, 
Mm, I am not happy <laughs> with anything that's on offer, and it's. Uh, but like, like, let's talk about the eclipse in particular. Then, uh, how, given that it is, uh, given that it will, in, we may surmise, and I think reasonably surmise that it will involve the person of President Trump. Uh, how, what kind of things does this look like for him, this uh, Great Again Eclipse? It's a good question. Not sure I have a good answer for it. One thing I'll say about eclipses is that it is easier to ascertain the magnitude of events which issue from them than it is to figure out the exact quality uh, of the event. Um, again, there's a certain... There's often a certain strangely faded quality, as if something was just waiting to happen, but it had already been written um, to what happens under big eclipse transits. And that's that always has something of that, that faded quality is always extremely poetically personal. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It doesn't... Um, um you I, I i you often fail to grasp its essence by simply describing it in terms of the qualities that astrology can is it hot or cold is it fast or slow is it you know the, these sort of things are how we kind of nail down and delineate events on a very simple level the this is a solar eclipse on the head of the dragon um and it speaks very strongly to overreach and being punished for overreach, right? Um, and that's something which, uh, which I think people can take into their individual navigation of that period, um, because I think this will, that'll be an odd pair of weeks for more than just Donald Trump. Uh, it's a very powerful eclipse, and um, you know, if it falls into a sensitized area of your chart or on top of a planet, you'll definitely notice. And so part of, you know, a big part of the, the dragon's head or Rahu in the, um, well, in the Indian tradition, but also in a lot of um, East Asian traditions, um, has a lot to do with, so if you think about the dragon's head, it's about biting off more than you can chew. Um, and on a positive level, you'll see Rahu or the dragon's head associated with rising to a level that no one thought was possible, including yourself, and then having to make and then to sink or swim there. Um, I think a lot of people will actually experience it as, how should we say, this burst of, or along with other things, there'll be this burst of confidence and belief in themselves they're like oh i can do that i can do what i was i could do what i never dared to do before but it's this sort of hot unsustainable rush that you kind of need to assimilate to make you know to make it something you can actually use um it, you know for it it's also, you know, it's got this quality of inflammation, like you run the system too hot and then, you know, <laughs> and, then every, and then things start breaking down. And so it's this, it's this sort of big dollop of crazy, of solar energy in a sense um, that'll be up to people to assimilate. You know, it's sort of like seeing what you could become, seeing what you could do. Um, and it's something people might have gotten a hint of in February during the uh, the lunar eclipse in Leo, but this solar eclipse will absolutely be um, uh, will will be of greater magnitude. There'll be a lot more juice. And on a practical level, you know, one of the things that um, the Vedic or um, Indian traditions of astrology say is that, you know, the, the, the nodes are inherently imbalanced. Like literally, you've got half a dragon and then the other half of the dragon, right? You obviously need both a head and a tail <laughs> to, have, to have a whole creature. Um, and the, they can do good and bad things or favorable and unfavorable things, but the, the energy is inherently unbalanced um, and that you kind of need to do the balancing yourself um, and or you need to sort of ritualize that balancing. There are one of the things that I've done for... 
well, I don't know, most of the last decade is um, I always do the uh, the mantras to Rahu or Ketu during the period surrounding an eclipse. They're very simple. They're on YouTube. There are several of each. Um, but, you know, you have a ritual technology which is sensitized to the eclipse um, to the eclipse cycle, um, and there's really no reason not to take advantage of it. I, I find that it works uh, very well. Um, and there are also, you can research, if you're of a, a more ritual mindset, you know, there are various um, uh, propitiation rituals, like uh, the offering of black rice, right, to the god who eats the to to the god who eats the sun, things like that. But I would say this one, you know, you, you might want to set up a a ritual uh, filter so that as it comes through, it's not so imbalanced. Um, eclipses, uh, you know, eclipses can also be because they're imbalanced. A lot of times, people go temporarily crazy, or their bodies go temporarily crazy, and they get sick. Um, it's something you want to. It's it's water you want to filter before you drink. That's a good way of describing it. Uh, gosh, the mind boggles if it's a combination of. Um overreach and unpredictable hot power and a weird sense of fate the, the mind boggles as to how that's going to land on him that could be literally anything <laughs> yeah that, that's what point. i said like yeah. um, you know if it's a fate thing like it, you could be poetic about it obviously everyone thinks impeachment which is still very difficult with the house as it is but if it's fate he could be betrayed uh you know it's that kind of um, betrayed by someone he didn't think he could be betrayed by, given the, how leaky the White House is. God, this is uh, this is going to be one of the you know that um, image of uh, that kind of meme of Putin eating popcorn. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do the mantra, get a bug out bag, and think of that, <laughs> and think of that fucking image because this could be that's going to land the, in a. In an interesting way, isn't it? I mean, because we spoke last time about how it's um, it lines up with the ECM, so something's going to happen uh, Americanness wise, and uh, yeah, interesting well, and to the think year, about. Yeah, and the year ends. Uh, the way that the year ends is um, uh, it's just very final. Um, there, so we get that transition of Saturn into Capricorn, which I've, I've talked about several times, which is very important historically for America, right? We're talking about the transition from 88 to 89, right? We're talking about uh, the transition from um, the 50s into the early 60s, from 1929 to 1930. Um, you know, we have the beginning of very different epochs or micro epochs, right? Um, and so, you know, it, Saturn, Saturn comes home when it comes to Capricorn, Capricorn, Saturn rules Capricorn. And so there's, you know, the, there's the, the weight of a new situation or of the new situation always starts to settle in during that time. It's, um, and so what's interesting is, so that, that, that moves, um, Saturn moves into Capricorn about a week before Christmas, a little early Christmas present for everyone. But what's interesting is that transition is kind of what December is all about, because um, Mercury stations retrograde on top of Saturn just as it's about to make that transition, right? And so, you know, Mercury is in some ways like um, a sort of meta factor. Whereas, so if Mercury is the is the one talking, what does Mercury have to talk about, right? And so Mercury's um, conjunctions or aspects to other planets um, uh, have everything to do with characterizing a Mercury retrograde or anything interesting that Mercury's doing, right? And so what is Mercury going to talk about for a month? Mercury's going to talk about Saturn about to change signs and then and then go back and then conjoin Saturn again. Um, and so I believe shortly after, let me check it. I think, so. I think Mercury, yeah, Mercury, uh, comes back and conjoins Saturn after it's made the transition into, into Capricorn. Let me double check that. Yeah. Um, so we get Mercury turning backwards on Saturn at the border, going backwards and then coming and then hitting Saturn again, 
um, in January to talk about, you know, to give to check in on the other side of that border. So it's Mercury really escorting Saturn over that border. You know, which it's interesting because it's very much um, that's very much like a Janus gate, right? Because um, it just so happens that Saturn moves over into Capricorn right on the solstice. Right. So that it's it's interesting. It's very it's very powerful. And those degrees are all directly connected to the de, to the degrees of the uh, the solar eclipse. And so those those two events um, are tied together. It's hard not to imagine that um, what was, you know, set in motion during the solar eclipse uh, doesn't reach um its conclusion or we don't st- we don't see outcomes during that december retrograde um and i would also add part of the fun with this solar eclipse coming up is that uh mercury will be retrograde during it um in uh, very much the same portion of sky and so you know it's always nice to throw a little a little confusion a little uh, miscommunication into a period where <laughs> which is already difficult to figure out uh and mars is up there too so it's you know it's a solar eclipse plus plus um it's really so, yeah. interesting so the 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 mercury saturn relationship at the end is like an archivist entering an underworld library again uh and it does, if it's a constitutional crisis, that's literally what will be happening over the December period, which will be looking back at the actual formational documents of the country <laughs> to work out what to do, particularly if they kind of connect to each other. That could get very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, and um, yeah, and it's just really interesting to watch Mercury just walk Saturn over the border. Um because it's again, <clears throat> as far as borders go, that's probably the most important sign shift I think that that Saturn does. And the Saturn in Capricorn puts pressure economically on the U.S. chart. Um, it's there's always a recession, there or always there were in the 20th century. There's always a recession that coincided with Saturn's time in Capricorn. They were of very different intensities, right? Um, like early 90s. And um, early 60s, not by any means on the same scale as the Great Depression, right? Or the beginning of the Great Depression, which occurred as Saturn moved into Capricorn. Um, but it's, um, it's certainly, um, mm, mm, it's a bubble popper. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I, um, I think a lot of people are wondering how long the overheated machine can keep going before it breaks down. And it's, it seems like the discussion has shifted to when and where um, are things going to, you know, are the wheels going to, is it the wheels that will fall off? Will it be a gasket, you know? Um, and so it might happen earlier, but I, I don't know. Uh, Saturn and Capricorn is historically um, a time where there's uh, a correction for the American economy. So uh, we've got the eclipse and we've got uh, Saturn going into Capricorn. Uh, anything else before we, uh, um, anything else about yeah. H2? Yeah. Um, so when, when is this coming out, Gordon? Uh, mid-June. Okay, this will be just in time. So I know a lot of people have incorporated into their vocabulary some sense of what mercury retrograde periods are like and maybe even you know having uh, some some tricks to navigate those more clearly um but there's also um another thing that happens with mercury um where so mercury retrogrades occur when mercury passes between the sun and the earth right it's as close as it gets and the sun's rays obscure mercury so you can't see it now, there's also a period of invisibility where Mercury is on the far side of the sun, right? Um, and there's a conjunction in the middle of that. And those, ha- those also happen three times a year, but people don't freak out about them because they tend to be kind of good. Um, so the, just to, you know, if we're looking at a myth cycle of Mercury, when it's visible being here on Earth, Hermes is here on Earth doing stuff, playing tricks. Um, writing books, and then there's the underworld part. But Hermes and gods of a uh, cognate function also go up. They go up, down, and in the center. And so, um, 
You can look at Mercury's time up there. That you can look the look at his up on Mount Olympus, if you like the Greek context or whatever abode of oh, the not quite the the somewhat more um, rarefied strata of the the world. And so, a lot of times, you get some really interesting visions of what could be, um, and um, of you know the connection to some refracted facet of divinity or underlying power when mercury is on the far side of the sun looking out into space rather than looking down into the details of the earth um and if people like playing with uh with mercury um you know playing working along with the mercury cycle um then i i think that um doing doing a little something tuning in to mercury's wavelength uh during that superior conjunction on the far side uh, would be really interesting because it occurs on the day of the solstice this year it's um yeah it, it's pretty neat there's a so there's a from an astrological point of view there's a mercury sun conjunction at zero degrees cancer um and you know if, if you played with the, the retrograde um, you you get one thing, and that's an interesting thing and irreplaceable. But there's this other equally important thing that Mercury does. So that would be the more uh, here on the West Coast of the United States. That would be the morning of June 21st. Very cool, very cool. Well, that's a few days before my birthday, so I'm going to play with that. Yeah, um, and I guess you know one more thing about. Uh, I guess two more things real quick about Q2. Uh, so over the summer. Uh, or H2, excuse me. So Q3, H2, the summer here uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the, the Sun and Mars spend all sorts of time together. And so that, that means that Mars is as far away from us as it gets. It's on the far side of the Sun, just like I was talking about with Mercury, except way further because it's Mars. And that um, it really for almost the entire summer, the Sun and Mars are right next to each other. Um, and so that means that you won't see Mars all summer um, unless you have a very good vis- uh, very good viewing conditions and a very good telescope. Um, and so that that phase with Mars where Mars is conjoined the Sun is considered to be a phase of purification for Mars. Whereas um, the retrograde of Mars last year is when uh, is when Mars is as close to the Earth as possible, as bright as possible, and it's sort of a getting dirty and causing chaos period. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the other side of that cycle, um, and so it's uh, it's very good for for purifying your relationship to whatever you're doing Mars wise, right? Like your your understanding of power. You know, your need, you know, whatever, yeah, your understanding of power, whatever your, you know, your kind of workout regimen is, how you create physical strength and all of that. Um, It's, it's a, it's a going inward and turning invisible in order to refine. And so that's just sort of part of the background uh, for the summer, um, the Northern Hemisphere summer. And then in the fall, in October, we get Jupiter leaves Libra. Uh, shortly after, um, uh, <clears throat> shortly after the last opposition with Uranus, and then Jupiter will be in Scorpio for the next year, and that's a very different kind of Jupiter. Whereas Jupiter in Libra is really, mm, you know, it's very let's make peace, let's try to find something we can all live with. Um, Jupiter in Scorpio is more, mm, how should we say? Um, it provides a blessing for doing dangerous things and coming out the other side, crawling down very, you know, um, exploring various caves (laughs) Um, and coming back to the surface world uh, intact. It's a, it's a, it's a more daring, bold, martial uh, uh, place for Jupiter. And that'll just be a shift. And that'll, again, that's a, that's a year's worth of shift. That's a, That's Jupiter does Lara Croft. So it's, you know, uh, going through tunnels, coming out with good things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, And that's, you know, and I think that might be some of what we need uh, in 2018 with, uh, what did you call it? The uh, Goat King of Death. 
Yes, with the uh, under the rule of the Goat King of Death, um, you know, and with the the past surging up all around us in great ways, right? I think you've done a lot on this podcast um, where you've had a lot of guests who've shown actually this traditional herb lore is useful. We didn't need to throw that away, um, you know, once we got an X-ray machine. Right, just as one of many examples, or um, with starships, for example. Right, there's all this stuff. <laughs> there's all this ancient stuff, um, and it's um, it may be buried, but it's not necessarily dead. Um, and so that you know, the ability to go into the mm, entombed structures of the past and maybe liberate a few things, as well as maybe put a few things to rest permanently. Um, maybe exactly what we need so because i was going to ask one of the last questions is it seemed like um saturn in capricorn is a uh is politically conservative um but they're they're in it, the sense actually that, yeah so a uh, friend and colleague of mine nick dagan best actually uh did a little study on every on the charts of Oh, hundreds and hundreds of representatives over a series of years and Capric or excuse me and Republicans are much more statistically likely to have Saturn and Capricorn. Well, conservatism is that idea that, you know, um, the past is in some sense better than today or where we're going. Um, and so if it's just the point I was getting to was if you have Jupiter in Scorpio, that I don't want to say moderates conservatism, but it suggests that the things that can come from the past or our exploration of it for 2017, 2018 don't necessarily have to be that kind of um, Tory fox hunting <laughs> sort of a, sort of exploration of the past. It can be rediscovery of things like herb lore and, and, and the, the kind of reformation of identity uh, based on the, the the things that Jupiter finds when he's Lara Crofting. Yeah, well, I, it's certainly doable on an individual level. Yeah. Right? You know, the, um, oh, when you're looking at Jupiter, it's often a matter of opportunities offered and then whether you met the, the big planet halfway or not. Um, and the collective seems... People en masse seem to do a pretty bad job of that, but uh, people individually uh, often impress me. Well, that's... Uh... Oh, I did want to mention before we move on, so Mike Pence is a Saturn in Capricorn, uh, and I and I was uh... like, Ugh. so this is his second Saturn return, which is about to begin. And so I was like, hmm, maybe there's a clue there, right? Maybe does that mean, is that an indicator that he will take office? Uh, or not. And so I looked at his first Saturn return because there's literally one precedent for for that um, that cycle in his life. And um, he ran for office multiple times and, and failed uh, during his first Saturn return. So, yeah, it is interesting. Because um, we have a we have a day for him, but I I, I do not know of a, like a good reliable birth time. So we can say Saturn was in Capricorn in what degree because that doesn't change in a day. But we don't know for sure his moon, and we don't know his ascendant. So, um, but I thought that was it was interesting. Certainly, that will be uh, an important chapter in his life, <laughs> rather for for good or for ill. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's there. Well, so it's going to be an interesting. I guess continuing with the theme, it's going to be a, a interesting remainder of twenty seventeen. Yeah, well, it's sort of like um, uh, I don't know, like um, in a sense, the eclipse and what it sets in motion is the beginning of the main event. Whereas a lot of the re much of the rest of this, much of the, the lead up to that this year has been a set of preliminary matches and like, you know, that like the training montage videos that they show for boxers or fighters or like, you know, where they're like, you know, they're talking shit about, you know, their opponent and you see them lifting weights and running really fast and punching stuff. But I, I feel like the battle royale begins with uh, the solar eclipse. One thing that I should also note about solar eclipses is that 
you um if you're tuned in at all you will absolutely notice that you know something something weird is happening there's some intense stuff going on during the period of the eclipse and i would say a uh, week on each side um or maybe the the lunar eclipse and then the ensuing two weeks to the solar eclipse and then a week after that would be the the sort of blast radius of that where it's really obvious um but when you're do when you look at traditional work that seeks to predict events augured by the solar eclipse, um, it has until the next eclipse um, to work itself out. And so the idea is that um, that is seeded and sometimes dramatically and quickly, um, but that you don't get everything promised by an eclipse in the next two weeks. Gotcha. And what's interesting about that next two weeks, or excuse me, that next six months, is that overlaps with that really interesting um, period in December with Mercury sort of playing Saturn out of um, uh, of Sagittarius and into Capricorn. Right. Well, uh, this is uh, this is going to be a um, a six to ten months to watch. So, uh, for people who do actually want to watch more. Mr. Kopic, uh, where do they go to find out more about uh, you and and such things and uh, and so on? Well, um, so my website is my name dot com, Austin Kopic dot com. I'm sure it'll be in the show notes. Mm-hmm. It better it better be in the show notes. It um, is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I I I do a little paragraph on every day of uh, every month of the year. Um, with kind of my take on what the space weather looks like um i'm working on integrating more uh more lunar mansion material into that frankly uh the lunar mansions are you know are basically a system designed to um designed to be able to describe what is favorable or unfavorable on either a magical or mundane level um the moon's position on a single day um it's the the moon's motion over one single day and so it feels like it's perfectly made for or it's it literally is designed for daily delineations and um the lunar mansions are also all defined by uh, the moon's relationship with stars and i've been increasingly interested in integrating the stellar layer into both my sort of professional writing output as well as into my personal practice. So I'll be doing that. I'll be working in that material soon. Um, And then I also write a monthly summary. Um, And in addition to that, I'm, uh, I usually write weekly columns, but I'm actually going to be switching the format up uh, to every 10 days uh, so that the columns are lockstep with the decans or faces. Um, I wrote a book about that, and they're highly they recommended me- book. Thank you. A highly meaningful and useful division of time. And so, I don't know, I, I've, I've had the, this very strong feeling, which I've, um, I can make a case for now, but I had the, the feeling before I had the case, um, that the, uh, the decans, the solar decans and the lunar mansions together are really the, the minute or the, the hour and minute hand of the magical clock. Um, and so I'm kind of slowly reshaping my output to reflect that. I, uh, uh, yes, I think your, I think your sensation is correct in, in that sense. Uh, as you know, we, um, we're big faces fans around here. Indeed. Yeah. They, they're, they're wonderful. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, so all that comes out. Um, that's all free on the website. A lot of people do support me on Patreon. Thank you um, to everybody who supports my project on Patreon. Um, and if you support me on Patreon, you get stuff early. Instead of having to wait for the daily to come out every day, I send you a PDF with that whole month um, on the 1st or the 30th. Um, there are you know, various prizes and advantages. Um, but you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, um, pay anything, uh, to get any of that just on the website every day. Um, yeah. Oh, and I, I have a project coming up 
Should I mention that? I've you mentioned should. it before. But no, it's but actually like you can, coming like, up. This time you can, in fact, give details around it. So uh, you definitely yes, should. Yes, I can. <laughs> so for, gosh, I think it's been almost two years. Um, I've been working with uh, Three Hands Press on an anthology of essays about astrological magic. And um, when I emailed people initially, I kind of um, wrote up my, my dream team. And I pretty much got everybody on the list. And so this project, uh, which is going to be called The, the Celestial Art, um, is finally got a release date. The release date is in September of this year. Um, I believe it will go up for pre-order uh, at threehandspress.com on at the end of July. And um, it's just fantastic. I, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I was uh, impressed and intimidated uh, reading through everybody's contributions. So people that might be familiar to you and the listeners of Rune Soup, we have Dr. Aaron Cheek. Who? Uh, we have Do- <laughs> Dr. Aaron Cheek. Yeah, right? Yeah, the sweetest Kiwi out there. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, Eric Perdue. Who? Um, yeah. No, I'm going to keep doing this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Al Cummins. Uh, Dr. Al Cummins. Dr. Al, yes, very good. Uh, Mallory Vadois. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Also, they haven't been on the podcast, but, you know, think about it. John Michael Greer, um, who translated the Latin Picatrix into contemporary English. Um, We have Demetra George. Um, We have Lee Lehman. We also have Dr. Ben Dykes, um, who's... If you're not aware, an absolute translation machine, um, he's probably done 2,000 plus pages of uh, medieval and Arabic astrological texts in the last 10 years. Just uh, we, the astrological community owes him a fantastic debt. Uh, we also have Freedom Cole, who's an excellent Vedic astrologer. Um, and am I leaving anybody out? Oh, um, uh, Dan Schulke will be contributing, mm-hmm. as will I. I was going to say, yeah. you have left someone out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we've got also it. it uh, oh, and Jason Miller. Yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yes. And Jason Miller. Um, so, um, yeah, there are a lot of different perspectives. I, um, I didn't want to do just a planet, you know, astrological magic as according to Agrippa and that's it. We have Eric, so we're doing that, right? And the there's Agrippa's Pikachu. covered. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, so we're doing that, but I also wanted to uh, include, uh, I wanted to make sure that there are a variety of essays from a variety of angles um, and on a variety of topics. And I'm really excited uh, about it. I think it's uh, it's going to be fantastic. Well, sir, I very much look forward to um, these six monthly chats. So uh, thank you once again uh, for your time. And uh, and I guess I'll speak to you on the other side of the eclipse. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's my pleasure, Gordon. Lots to think about there, as ever. For RuneSoup Premium members, expect more on the deckhands and their ritual use as this quarter's bonus presentation. Austin and I uh, put something highly experimental together almost exactly a year ago, and I spent the intervening time making sure it's fit for human consumption, or at least fit for you guys anyway. Uh, Regarding the next six months and beyond, uh, you know, this is something Austin and I have touched on before, and it sort of came up in the recent episode with Chris Brennan as well. Even if there were zero correlation between astrology and and terrestrial events, astrological thinking would still provide a demonstrable improvement in your life simply by offering you a longer, more contextualized perspective on world events and, and, you know, the large and small bumps in your own road. So uh, if you'd like to know more, Uh, about it, get over to austincopic.com and get involved. For more about the show and the premium membership, head over to runesoup.com. Let me know your thoughts at the RuneSoup Facebook page. And as ever, find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.